Greetings, everyone, from the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngunnawal people, never ceded, um, and, uh, and we pay our respects to their elders and leaders, past, present, um, and emerging. Um, we're very lucky today to have John Gardner, um, who is an old ANU director. So he did a PhD at ANU, finishing in 1982 with his thesis on cult ritual and social organization among the West Myanmar of PNG. And he taught at Sydney briefly, and then he came back for almost 30 years um, at the ANU yeah. um, at the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology. And since 2008, uh, or much of the last 20 years, he's been um, teaching and moving between Lucerne and Heidelberg uh, in Europe. He's a bit of a godfather for transdisciplinary studies in New Guinea, don't deny this. No. Um, but in many ways, he prefigures and kind of embodies what we've been trying to do at, um, at ECWI. He's got this deep interest in, in social theory and the philosophy of the social and biological sciences. And he's collaborated with the much other people, Rob Attenborough on nutrition and ecology and epidemiology and demography of the Myanmar, with Jack Golson on the uh, archeological history of agricultural production in the highlands. He's been a visitor now at ECTI for several months. He's working on a major uh, book project that really assembles much of this work on, on Myanmar. And the title of today's seminar, which speaks to his book project, Oh, it's been truncated. It has um, been truncated. I don't know model the history of me and speakers, but I will read out the subtitle that he had originally because mm -hmm. he needs to explain it. Mm -hmm. um, without the sky no. hooks of social science. I, do I really need to explain it? Well, we're in trouble. Oh, okay. So sky hooks is a word that I pillaged from um, Daniel Dennett and uh, in his in uh, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, I think it is. But anyway, the, the idea is that nobody should be worried about reductionism so long as the sort of reducing mechanism only involved cranes because cranes are grounded <laughs> but if there if there's anything hanging off a skyhook then you need to be suspicious <laughs> okay we've been warned <laughs> no, no way that's just okay <laughs> right it's very nice to be here it's very nice to see old friends um, very nice. Um, and it's, it's been very good to be here. Um, so, okay, so the, the quote from Deuteronomy that Weber uses in Economy and Society and suggests that somehow that the sentiment expressed in it is fundamental to all religious orientations to the world. Um, what's, okay. And I... I need to apologize for the terrible quality of the slides because most of my photographs and so on are in Lucerne. I shipped them back last year at great expense, not knowing I would be here this year. Um, so I need to apologize. I've sort of pillaged them from all kinds of places. Um, and there's, there was something else I was going to say first. It'll, co it'll come back to me. Um, Okay, so, um, right. Oh, what's it? okay? So that the bit that's obscured by the the banner across the top says everyone has a history, and and it's and narrativity. Okay, so this is London, uh, the, the Elephant and Castle in 1962, and there's. The one of the things I want you to think about is how you're involuntarily working out. I, I have a friend in Germany who is a sociologist, and he's done a research project on which showing photographs of people from various um, social uh, settings and backgrounds to just a naive um, social beings and getting them to say something about the social background of those in the photograph. And they can place class differences incredibly well. And one does it without noticing, which is, well, uh, it says something about, uh, um, it speaks to something I want to come back to later on. Um, and you could see there that uh, there's a hint of uh, other buildings and, and so on. And all of which gives you cue, cue. And just, it's my mother, father, 
mother's brother, mother's brother's wife. Um, Betty, Stan, Huey, and May. Uh, okay. Uh, as I said, I've taken things from all over the place. So this is um, Evelyn Fox Keller's book, very nice book, The Mirage of uh, the Difference Between Nature and Culture. Uh, and the, 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 the original idea comes from uh, Ned Hall, and she makes this cartoon as part of the book, and I've taken it from it, no doubt, violating all kinds of copyright. Um, so, yeah, it's just that sometimes, uh, actually very rarely, you can, you can give a causal account which can partition causes in ways as you can, in the way you can in the first one. So it says in, in, the, in, in model one, Billy, Billy fills the bucket with 40 litres of water, Susie fills it with 60 litres, so 40% of the water is due to Billy, and 60 to Susie. Okay, you can partition the causes. Now, he, Billy is operating the tap and Susie is operating the hose. It's impossible to, the, to explain or give a causal account of the buckets being filled in terms of contributions of uh, Billy and, and Susie. Um, and she uses it in ways that I find very congenial to say that when it comes to um, looking at social life, you, that you can't partition effects. In, in, in the, 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 the standard picture is the one on the right rather than the one on the left. Um, so biological versus social, nature versus Nurture, okay. And right, there. So this is going to tack between very general and very particular. And now we get to the, um, the to focus on the particularities. Okay, so that's the Northern Oak area. Ah, as I say, anybody recognize this hippie? I think he's related to the previous speaker. Yeah, I think you might be right about that. Um, yeah, that's from 76 or something. But I, a huge number of people uh, I, I'm sitting in front of do not do not pick out that young man as, be, as the same being as I am. Um, <laughs> sorry? <laughs> Maybe he isn't. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Well, yes and no. Okay, so this this is just for people who know nothing about the the mountain oak groups. Um, so, um, yeah, you speak to yourself. The fourteen odd languages counted amongst the mountain oak groups. They, it spans the border, which um, is of has been in the history of the 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 Mian of some political consequence. Um, and the epitome telephomin, that's where the station, telephomin station is, but also it's where the original cult house that the Mian believes still contains the bones of the primordial ancestor, who, and she has lots of different names, um, uh, but Arfeg is the one that's most widely known mm -hmm. because of the book. Okay. And this is now, so we met more moving north now to the Mian areas. Um, these Yasu and Oweninga, they're, they're left May groups. They're, they're linguistically very um, different. They're, they're, they're isolates, actually. Um, the Abal speakers are Upper Sepik peoples. <laughs> and it, actually, when I left Canberra, Abau was where I thought I was going to be working, but I got diverted by the provincial commissioner in Bonimo and said, you must go to Yapsi, which is in there somewhere. I think I've got, um, because we don't know anything about the people around there and we'd like to know. Um, and this is a terrible thing from my thesis, actually. But I just, 
that some of these names, Wamei, Fusibin, Sarawania, Evik, Ura, and so on, um, uh, will come up perhaps when I get to talking about actual particular events. Okay, so just this is just I took this from um, some online um, source, and it's just to show. This is uh, uh, actually an East Miami village, Bandicam in bit. Um, it's, it, it's associated with a particular group. Uh, close, it's quite close to um, Mianmin Station. And as you can see, you've got primary rainforest, villages, and gardens. Okay, so this is now we're going back to uh, the west, and this is the the August River, uh, which the Mian called the Arki River. That, but on the uh, recent maps, the August is fed by two rivers, the Arki and the Tabo, and this is the divide between them, sort of looking north. Um, on a trip I did in nineteen seventy five, and although the picture's awful. You can see a small settlement there. It's an Urat settlement. Um, and this is an old garden that I'm standing above. Okay, so and that's the hamlet from an, another view. And that, that's typical. You see secondary regrowth. And uh, one of the things, the, the Mian move a lot or moved a lot. I should say everything I say today. I'm, I'm trying to say is I feel confident that this is how things were between 1950 and um, perhaps the 1990s. Um, okay, and that's the the leader in in top place in um, in Mian language. The leader is called a Kamok. Um, a, a word itself, which is has an interest in distribution, you, the, that word and cognates of it are come me and then the and, and the this kind of semantic field is similar. So I think in in the in the Western Highlands or or Enga territory, Kamok means a kind of trading partner, um, but it means leader for the Mian. So you see his trophies. Hunter horticulturalist, yeah. Um, and that is, I said they move a lot. When when a group pioneers a new area, they build an amitam, which is a kind of a single dwelling in which the families of the part of the community um, occupy. Um, and the, there's a central floor and and then a raised platform around the edge where all the halves are located. And that's a, a Mian garden. Um, and um, it occasions comments sometimes, even from other anthropologists, about what an awful mess <laughs> Mian gardens are. Um, and it's true, they do look messy, but it, they function. Okay, so now some people, and I should I plan to give a trigger warning actually, because I uh, that there would be men in and women in traditional dress. Um, uh, so this is this is a a, a young man uh, from an, a a group a meet. And the translate the proper translation of this term meat, which in in lots of contexts means origin, um, is a matter of for discussion. But if we when we plan, or co especially if we thought of a cognatic plan, you wouldn't go too far off being anyway. So he's from a boblik. This is a Kiaps photo. Martin Kerr wrote a book called New Guinea Patrol, and this is an arrest patrol. And but these are Boblicks that Brian and I worked with, perhaps even this man, I, I, I don't know, um, 
it's from 65 but in 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 the 80s we were we were there doing doing some work um and the interesting thing about this picture is the thing on his head um it's called a manual and it's it's to do with initiation yeah um and in in in, in lots of mountain operations i actually think this is an aside but if you look at the manual and the head it's like a harvested taro with the with the um the leaves off and then the for for the taro you cut off the tuber which you consume and and the set you t carry off to another garden and replant okay this is man pretending to remove pith from red pandanas um just because he but he he wanted to do so, and you can see he's kind of laughing there. But what's this man? His name's Ayamsa, who was really important. In fact, the Paradisec have have lots of tapes from uh, interviews with with Ayamsa, um, and he's someone I'll talk about a bit later on. A Kamok, an Ivik Kamok, but this is in Urapmin, uh, in Urap area, and this is them preparing a Yamsat's Pandana's lunch. Okay, so the data sets that this is all based on. So 75, 77, when I went there as a Dirk Kymian social anthropologist intent on trying as best I could reproduce the kind of work that Alfred Jell had done for the UMDA, put mapping social organization, the mapping ritual and giving detail about the the the, the symbolic structure of the of the um, the rituals and then trying to explicate one in terms of t'other. Um, and that's what my thesis was really about. And then in 82 me and Robert Attenborough went up and with Tim Flannery and his mob to have a look uh, about to have a look at the possibility of doing further research and then we got this grant which is the title of there and so you and various a whole bunch of people were involved and it was to do with nutritional status morbidity malaria metric demographic data and their variation because one of the things that my uh thesis had shown and which befuddled me enormously was that the any lots of sociological indices varied through across the Myanmar, um, the northern foot. So that I just realised I forgot to put in a bloody um, <laughs> um, PowerPoint slide, which that so. And I do apologize. So if you imagine a, neck, uh, a nice triangle with, um, with the um, hypotenuse representing the northern fall of the, 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 the mountains in the northern Ok area, the range of the Mian is about from about, well, that Bandika Mimbib is at about 1100 meters, but um, where I, the village was, the ice stayed in it was about 200 meters at, at Yapsing so it's quite a range and it's it's a very complex landscape um okay so get to back and then the, so the 83 to 86 was this big effort um and basically the the idea was to test something that John Stanhope said in uh, a 1970 paper on demography of New Guinea that and it's just a throwaway remark at the end but people picked up with it um that the the salubrious highlands represent sources of population thriving if you like and the fringes represent a population sink because when you move from say uh 2,000 meters in down to a thousand, even a thousand meters, 
then there's going to be a very nice increase in the uh, and the anophelines and uh, the culicides, all these mosquitoes, that's to say, um, and therefore malaria becomes an issue. Okay, so that's that's. Oh. That's all right. We'll shoot you later. Yeah, we will do. Yeah, it's yeah. complicated. Um, <laughs> okay, the physical season and uh, the physical setting. There are two seasons. And seasonality was something I worried about a hell of a lot. But, and although there's a statistically significant difference in the rainfall across two seasons, it doesn't make any difference um, to, as far as the soil goes. I mean, and as I say, from April to November, it rains heavily in the late afternoon, evening, almost every day. And the rest of the year, it rains even harder. Um, and, and Luckily, I had, it was very hard to get data. I had spotty data over all my trips. But that, but Frida, which is it, just a couple of valleys over and in the same kind of setting, because they're planning a mine there, they've had to do all their hydro stuff. And that's a quote. Um, average rainfall is eight metres. Climate is dominated by local weather um, rather than by synoptic scale monsoonal effects. Uh, or the movement of intertropical uh, convergent zone. The terrain controls patterns of air circulation, and th that's very important. The terrain does that, and it's even reflected in things like parofertility rites, where people pray to the ancestors to control the the um, the cloud cover um, in a very weak seasonality, which is a relief since we did we did our research. Only we could only do it over a six month period. Okay, some facts about the Mian way of life. So, in common with other mountain groups, there's a preference for endogamous marriage um, and immediate reciprocity if you can work it out. Um, that, that, and I can talk about the experimental period later on if it, if it's interest if anybody's interested. The male cult, which is widely regarded as diacritical of Mandanoc culture, has highly variable significance within the Mian. You know, um, Frederick Barth, who the old hand will have heard of, a very very famous anthropologist in his time, um, he studied with the southern Mandanoc. And he originally studied the particular group, the Bactaman, a nation of 173 people, as he put it. <laughs> um, uh, but it, and it was it was you know a ritual exegesis, and um, a, a, and then he, and he wrote a, a book which was well received, ritual and knowledge amongst the Bactaman, and then. Over about a twelve-year period, he read lots of PhD theses. Almost all the other research in at Mountain Oak area has been done by PhD students like me, and he read them all. And then he thought, "How how can one explain the va variation across the Mountain Oak in ritual practices?" And he had all kinds of elaborate metaphors about, you know, what would happen if if a if a, um, a, a a Presbyterian from Australia went into a church of a Presbyterian in, in Britain and saw this utterly transformed the Eucharist. Everything's different. Everything's different. So he says this is the kind of um, uh, explanatory problem we have with the mountain off. And he tried to uh, explain it. And in the end, it's a bit limp. It's got, that was Cosmologies in the Making, that book, the Cosmologies in the Making. And it's a bit Bit limp, and it relied a lot upon the creativity of, of, of individual cult elders immersed in the symbolism of, of the cult. So it's a kind of divergence. But the Mian had as much variation amongst these 2,500 people as he canvassed in the book comparing all the, you know, lots and lots of different mountain cultures. Okay. Uh, so, but every, everybody agrees, it's actually not true of the, the most lowly 
uh, Leanne, that the cult is uh, critical and important. And that's true, it is, it is very important. And even the, the lowlanders that don't ever do any ritual know about the, as it were, they, they're in touch with the cosmology that underlies it. And the, it's it, that cosmology is important to them. How do you make the taro grow, for instance? Mm -hmm. um, so, and the scale of intensity and intensity of interaction within social networks varies a lot. Okay. God, time's galloping past. Okay, is it, please, if there's anything that's unclear, ask me. Um, and this is the the last point. The lowest lying, me and people, there's these groups that are the furthest north. Um, they, the other me and say they're not me and anymore. Um, they don't plant taro, really. They live off sago. And hunting's really good in the low altitude. Um, and, and, but their sociality, it's like the, the, Mian, the Mian overall, in the best kind of metaphor I, I have is that Mian's, you know, when you make a blood slide, you, if you put it, when you say, I take it most people have had a blood slide taken or seen it, you know, they put a, doll, a bit of blood on and then they get this on the slide and then they get the cover and they streak it and it spreads across. Well, there's a kind of socio film that the Mian have across this complex uh, material landscape. And by the time you get to the end, their sociality is incredibly thin. They're tiny, tiny groups that, um, and I, despite my best efforts, I could never really spend any time with them. I once went down, I spent my 25th birthday waiting for some guys to show up. There was a body on a on the dripping platform outside and they'd all gone. We waited for a week. The guys I was with stuffed themselves with cassowary, crocodiles, couscous, because the hunting was so good and even compared to where they live. And, uh, but I never really, later on I got some interaction with them, but Bernard Juira, who the French anthropologist who, who worked um, north of the, the sea peak, near, near where Alfred Gell worked, the, I can't remember the name of the book, Blood is in the title. Uh, Robin, can you remember the name of the book or the group that he worked with? Anyway, but he walked, he, he, came, he just showed up in where I was one day and said, I've been walking for 10 days through Mian territory. And those people that they couldn't get over it, how kind of deprived they seemed. Their gardens were awful and so on. And there is very small, the, the sociality, as I like to put it, gets is extremely thinly spread. The film is running out. Okay. So here are some hard data. At least I like I hope they're hard data. Um, the productivity of horticulture varies with altitude. Um, taro yields a 50%. Brian and I weighed a, like a couple of thousand individual taro tubers. And that's what it, it is. What it says there is uh, the result of that. The productivity of hunting increases in the lower altitudes. Um, Yeah, and I guess the second sentence in the in this thing about the upshot is a mode of production wherein labor powers, labor power matters more than other forces of production. Um, it's so people, this is a a people obsessed rather than a land or physical resources obsessed way of life. Um, oh yeah, there's that thing about the socio film, yeah. Mosquitoes, mosquito biting densities, malaria, filariasis, they're all, and filariasis is the thing that produces elephantiasis, and that is also mosquito-borne, and um, 
it's unevenly distributed. And it's interesting, uh, when I first went there, it was very, the, the, in the, low, the area around Yapsi Station, which is where I, but the village I was in was, was there, he had Abal people who have been on the CPIC for generations and generations, one assumes, but you, one very rarely met a man, an Abal man with any physical, or a woman actually, because women get symptoms in their breasts of um, elephant, of phil filarial infection. But in, that, in the village that I was in, something like 30% of men had obvious um, symptoms of filarial infection in their legs or their testicles. Uh, and, well, you can say it's, it's a severe mortality. That's at the, the IMR, you know, uh, when they finished processing, because they helped a lot in the processing of our blood slides and so on. This is a severe mortality regime. And it's, it's life expectancy of, of birth is 36, it's males versus females. Infant mortality is 174 per thousand live births in, in the higher altitudes, but 222 per thousand in the lower altitudes. And other burdens, we, we once did some work on growth patterns, the, the, the growth curve of children, and you get the same kind of story. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Actually, there was some. Yeah, and now, very uh, different. Time. Anthropology, uh, ethnography at least, involves what Jim Clifford once and Clifford Gears picked up on deep hanging out. Yeah. Um, and if you, we call it participant observation. Um, and sometimes we even go so far as to label it a method, but <laughs> it's basically just deep hanging out. Um, and um, it's impossible to do that, except within a kind of pre-theoretical participant attitude. And that comes from P.F. Strawson, you know, this uh, Freedom and Resentment, this very famous paper, in which he distinguishes um, the, as it were, the immediacy of, you can uh, relate to people in a pre-theoretical, totally spontaneous way as another being, yeah? And those, in, those interactions always produce what he called reactive attitudes. Um, but on the other hand, you can, for policy purposes, or for legal purposes, you can constitute a person in in outside the manifest image, which is what he called the. That's the one we operate with in the participant uh, participant interactions, but the other one is this kind of objective way. And, and for policy purposes, you might relate to, or legal purposes for hope, and obviously for investigative purposes medical uh, uh, investigative purposes, you can relate to them not outside the man, you don't use the manifest image. Although if you look at any doctor's interaction with a patient, it's rife with reactive attitudes and uh, yeah, uh, and, uh, and it's firmly within the manifest image. Okay, and I just, I just wanted to say that my time with the Mian, was astonishing. I mean, the the quality, the kind of the way that some a poet might render there, or a good uh, novelist but might render the quality of their sociality. It's just full of joy, hilarity. There's lots of relaxed companionability, and there's a huge amount of solicitousness. You know, people worry about one another. They're intimately connected. This life world is very, very, very intimate. Um, and I, I was trying to think about, you know, if, if you think about all the kinds of sociality we might 
experience over a lifetime. It's there was something about Mian, you know, village sociality that reminded me of the the school playground. You know, anything can happen. Everybody knows everybody else. Everybody likes somebody else. Like some of the other people and not the others, they worry, they don't worry, they trust some, mistrust others, worry about some, you know, the, the school bully, for example, the people worry about the school bully, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's just um it it's it's very intimate. And there's there's a nice some nice work or well, some nice papers by Nurit Bird Davy, who worked with uh, Nayaka Hunter Gatherers in um in, in, in India. And she has this worry that anthropology is scale blind, that we, our, con our sort of operational concepts aren't very good at picking up the difference between small scale intimate interactions um, and, and uh, where we, we're all our best concepts are ones that apply to, say, nation states and their bureaucracies and uh, and the social spaces that they create. And uh, I mean, I think it's outdrawn. Uh, you know, if you think about the work of Irving Goffman, for instance, who was all face to face. Um, but even he couched it. He thought Durkheim was his was his uh, you know fat, the, the the ancestor he should worship. So. Um, The anthropologist is professional. Uh, and when we report, we do so, it's obvious, in terms of the prevailing theoretical formulations and those theoretical formulations themselves are responsive to prevailing understanding, understandings in the scientific image. It's, a, if you, it's a, yeah, it, it's striking how much under pressure of pressure of kind of critical conversation, people will invoke the word. They will use the word science. Um, oh, okay. There's a thing about. Okay, so the, the point I was going to make is that. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a, the most of the social science, the the prominent social science uh, orientations do this interpolation you know this is Althusser's word you know you're you're called you're um at, so that uh, it's the cultural dope view you know that you you are what your culture social structure whatever some kind of substrate su a sui generis substrate makes of you um so uh, there's Garfinkel's uh cultural dopes um and they offer those always, those formulations always contrast with life as viewed from within the manifest issue, the manifest image. You know, one's experience of social life as a, just as a liver of social life, and the terms in which social, the prominent social science um, paradigms. Yeah, so. And this was just a silly, I thought it was a good idea at the time, I'm not so sure now, but it, I don't know if you can see it, but it's it's from the First World War and I just, your conscience collective needs you, you know, because that it does. Um, now, I, is it, this, I, in trying to think about this project of giving an account of, of me and social life, I realised that it, it'd be very hard for me to avoid something that is now rightly repudiated, the great man vision of history. But Kamok are, in, in terms of Godele's distinction, they are definitely great men. There's not much transactions in wealth. Uh, uh, there's lots of transactions in value, but they're real values, food, marriageable partners, and so on. Um, so these are great men. And I have, I was going to give you three kind of examples. Dosibe um, was the 
Kamok of the village I lived in and Luluai uh, of the village. He was beloved by everybody, including me, I have to say. He and um, he, 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 there's this is a quote from uh, Robert Musil's A Man Without Qualities. It's, it's, you know, those that fabulous, rightly regarded as a fabulous novel. Um, and this is, he's describing um, uh, a father's reaction to his feckless son's extravagant purchase of a chateau. And, and, it, and Musil goes on, like when he learned about his son's acquisition of the chateau, it struck him as a transgression against limits all the more sacred for not being legally defined. And he rebuked his son even more bitterly than he had on other occasions. The basic premise of the father's life was affronted. As with many men who achieved distinction, this feeling was far from self-serving, but consisted in a deep love of the general good above personal advantage. In other words, he sincerely venerated the state of affairs that nevertheless had served him so well, not because it was to his advantage, but because he was in harmony and coexistent with it and on general principles. Even, and then he, he, uses, he, he, he carries on, even coldly calculating people do not succeed half so well in life as those with properly blended temperaments and uh, who are capable of deep feeling for the for those persons and conditions that happen to serve their own interest so uh, which is a, a a nice way of bringing out the distinction between say the shopkeeper who never cheats because it would be bad for business and the shopkeeper who never cheats because it's cheating and and that's unthinkable. And so Dasibe struck me as a person like that. Um, he had three wives, six children. Um, he cared about everybody. He helped everybody. Everybody trusted him. He was a fantastic gardener. He was a terrible hunter. He he was gored. He was gored so many times um, that people worried about him when he went off hunting. But um, he was just a very, very admirable human being. When I came back in uh, 1982, he was dead. His three wives were dead. Two of his children were dead. And in the interim, uh, eight other people had died. So it was a reduction between my last trip in 77 and when I came back in 82 of 30%. And the the village, the community was spread to the to they'd left the village, they and they people had gone where they felt safe because something was going horribly wrong. Um okay, so that that's the idea. He's he's just he had bad luck. He was a great man who suffered this terrible run of bad luck, which took him too. And then I was going to juxtapose it to his sister, uh, to his mother's brother, uh, classificatory mother's brother, Armbep. Armbep was someone who also had a bit of bad luck, but only a bit. But his responses to the bad luck um, were led to undermine people's um, faith in him as a leader. For instance, when his older brother died, he decided it was due to his older brother's wife and decided he would kill her. But she was also the sister of a, a, a young and very promising young man. And there was a terrible standoff with one arm aiming the um, arrow at the woman and Miak, the, the young, uh, the other man, aiming an arrow at, uh, at arm -bet. And it this was in a single community. There were, and of course, people prevailed upon them to put down their weapons. But the things that have been said made it unthinkable that the community continued. So it split. 
Um, and then later on, Armbet lost other you know, close relatives. And each time he withdrew into himself and wouldn't have it, he wouldn't visit. It's very important. Kamox must visit other Kamox and, and receive other Kamox as, as, as guests. Um, but he completely withdrew. And in the end, even his closest supporters, on the pretext of setting up some garden dwellings, some houses in gardens, effectively set up a separate hamlet, and he was left alone. Now, he would certainly have been the target of sorcery accusations, given how pissed off with life people knew he was. So if, so, if something happens to you, we see, well, you know, everybody's run afoul of arm bet at some point or other, or is connected to someone. You know. And a Yamsap. This is a man uh, that I showed you the photo of. A Yamsap died at Kamok um, and had an incredibly colourful life. He was the first, he, he was the son of the Kamok of one group. The, the, Mian territories usually have two or three settlements, each of which follows a great man, a Kamok. And um, that they're, they're, really, they're close, they're on the same territory, they're usually closely related. Um, the kind of matrilateral, or patrilateral ties binding them together are very great and so on, affinal ties. Um, but a Yamsap whose name, it, Ayam is good, means good in, in, uh, in the Mian language. And he was called a Yamsap because his father, Heratu, had come up with this incredibly clever plan, which was enabled him to kill a, an Atbalmin Kamok uh, uh, from across, he, he sucked him into something. And killed. So it, everybody agreed it was a great tr uh, trick and a Yamsap was named after this great trick. Um, but Ayamsap was obviously a chip off the old block and had a very colourful life. Um, but what I wanted to say, in, in 1970, 1976, he became very ill. And he came, he came, he came to me, he, he lived in another village, he came to our, uh, our village and he laid in our house cook. Um, and he, he said he couldn't eat. And uh, over about six weeks before he died, um, uh, my, my wife at the time thought he was suffering from a, a, a malaria attack and the uh, and pneumonia, but he wouldn't eat. He couldn't eat, and he accused almost every group he'd ever had anything to do with um, of sorcery, uh, uh, and we even arranged for a, an upper sepik um, diviner. To come and look at him, and this diviner pulled a six-inch six, six government-issue nail from um, from a Yamsap's back. But even that couldn't persuade a Yamsap that it wasn't an intra-Mian attack. And when he died, nobody thought it was uh, 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 the the Upper Sepik people who'd done it. Or even though a Yamsap had led a raid and, and killed some Abal people in, in the 50s. But when he died on his deathbed, he also had a very industrious, very strong, very productive daughter who was like five or six years beyond standard marrying age. And he wouldn't let her marry because she was so, she worked so well for him. And when, when he, on his deathbed, he demanded that a, that they put his bow and arrows in with him, and B, that they kill his daughter. Um, they didn't do any of that. They, did, they, they didn't do any of that, but they just fled. They abandoned the, the, the uh, I showed you the Amitam, the big house. They abandoned it um, 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 when, you know, a day's walk uh, uh, upstream to avoid his vengeful ghost. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry I messed it up and, and uh, I couldn't give you a more coherent um, um, uh, account of these, these different kinds of 
leaders. But the, the events there, it's the stuff of Mian history at the manifest level. People, a man wants to marry. He's in love. He, he, we might say he's love struck, wants to marry someone, but no one thinks he's worthy of the girl, of, the, of, of, of having the girl bestowed upon. He's resentful. Um, he, he does, um, you know, he, does, he, he gets involved in fights. Someone's injured and so on. It's just all this kind of stuff. A very big fight. A man, a man, a young man whose uh, mother was killed by his father died and then the father's brothers killed the wife because they figured they had some idea she was unfaithful and it was sorcery or something and he was so angry and uh mian anger often made me think of michael young on unawewe this kind of doing harming yourself in spite in order to and what this guy went who went to a very large village and just shot a man out of hand, left his bows and arrows, went back to his own village and waited for the raiders to come. And they killed him, but they also killed a lot, a lot of his uh, father's brothers as well. And so it's these kind of passions, the, the kind of emotional quality of, of daily life erupts in these incredible passions. And people know about these passions, they're mindful of these passions, and if it looks like it's brewing, people go, they have, they have some very interesting, uh, if people, if two men are, have a, have, um, have a, a serious disagreement, they'll, instead of standing face to face, they'll sit back to back, and a third man will sit next to them, and each person speaks to the mediating man, who then relays the message. So you know, Chris says you're an asshole. Okay, and I think he's an asshole too. You know, we, we, we never face it. So they, they worry about the passions, but that um, they erupt. And because of the smallness of scale of the social life, it, it's it's very they're very close. So things can be damped. There's a lot of people with an interest in damping conflict. And they work very hard to do so. But if they can't damp it, the a, a kind of break is the only thing that can happen. And uh, so there's a lot of, in, in Mian political history, there's a lot of exit. You know, uh, Exit, Voice and Loyalty, that book by Hirschman. There's a lot of exit. There's a lot of voice too. And there's a lot of loyalty. But the exits are the things that reconfigure the, the kind of social fields. Um, okay, I think. Okay, so. Well, this is, yeah. I, at the moment, I, I you it may I've not mentioned the word the C word, um, or the social uh, or culture. That's to say, um, uh, <laughs> so so far, um, um, or I, I I think that one could one can provide a coherent story of Mian history without a notion of culture. Um, and without and social structure, forget it. I mean, I knew that from my work in 75, 77. But without the notion of culture, you have people who can speak to one another, people who share values, but they also they have values that di diverge. And even when people share values, they have different interests in a particular value, which makes for uh, um, for conflict. And because the scale is so small, um, there's a kind of, if, if two brothers leave a village because they fear, um, because they've lost a, a, a third brother who they think was its internal source, so they leave a village. And now you've got a very solidary group, it's a pair. You've got uh, two brothers and their families. And if it goes well, it goes very well. 
But if there's if conflict or irritation, the stuff of social life, just think about any university department. Normal interaction generates frictions, which sometimes results in open conflict. Then you the two then you've got single family groups. And that's really what you have found in the most in the the um in those very, very low mountain off groups. Uh Mian groups. Okay. And it's interesting, is the Stanhope's model is about populations, it's purely demographic. And it seems to ex be part of the explanation of Mian sociality. But only what it, it's no good. You go if you got when you you got good reason to go. Go. <laughs> well, we can carry on tomorrow. Um, uh, I thought I was saying shit. <laughs> oh yes, Stanhope. So Stanhope's a, is a demo, it's a demographic, a demography level model. Okay, and you. And for sure, an the Anopheline population is not worried about Myanmar fights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, they, they're there anyway. And if you think there are many respects, for example, in which lowland Myan life is like outer Enga life. And if you think about the Enga, everybody who knows anything about the Enga knows you have these massive pig um, populations, very dense population. We have a picture of, of Enga life, but the, the outer Enga, Dawn Strikes, Gadio Enga, so it's Gadio, mm -hmm. yeah, they're Enga too. And the, the, and you could tell, and Stan Hope's model seems to to make help you make some sense of those contrasts. But while those processes may be necessary to the 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 configuration that I found amongst the Mian, they're not sufficient. The the what what makes for satisfaction in the sense that you feel you've got necessary and sufficient resources to explain what happened. You can't. You have to um, advert to the people's social and their. Beyond that, their psychological characteristics. So that's it's kind of musing on all that. Okay, so uh, and this first, this one, for instance, if you think about the initial conditions of the, we imagine the ancestral population coming across the mountain range from the south onto the, the northern edge uh, of the thing, people who we now call Mian, um, they seem to, it's reasonable to postulate they had a preference for endogamy, and it's certainly reasonable to postulate that they were committed to what Sterelde and Cope talk about, the agency view of misfortune, sorcery, yeah, a and actually, Vengeance by the ancestors, or ancestors are moral, not morally approve or disapprove of what's going on now too. Um, so it's the 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 kind and one of the things that that's why Fox Keller, we have we have uh, we have good generalizations, explanatory generalizations, which quantify only over people's intentional states. Is that out there? No, it's not. They quantify only over people's intentional states. We don't, it's, it's not only, you know, the hard sciences, which have good, sound, well-evidenced generalizations. Um, we do, you think about the, I was, it, it, while I was in the field, there was this enormous earthquake. And the panic which gripped each and every one of us. I mean, the, so the, we have good generalizations about people's tendency to panic when they're in a building and there's an enormous earthquake. 
we have very and we have very good generalizations about people's tendency to run to the bank if there's hyperinflation um so there's all we do have and and those and those generalizations quantify over intentional states of people their hopes beliefs and the and the kind of sentiments which are expressed in that first slide from Deuteronomy people's commitments to their loved ones their anxieties about threats to their loved ones their desire for re revenge when their loved ones have been harmed in some way and so the idea for me the idea of historical reconstruction of the kind I'm after offers an explanatory account of what actual folks are up to and I actually think that sort of 19th century ideas about science and typologizing and so on aside the impetus for what is now anthropology comes from puzzlement about what folks you don't know are up to when they do something what someone is up to when they give a great herd of pigs to someone else and then walk away feeling good although they don't have any pork to eat and the other people have got so i mean this these are the kind of puzzles um so yeah so and, and this is thing of, but we still need empirical causal analysis because and, and this is Foucault's version but you can excavate exactly the same sentiments certainly from Weber and also from Marx about people know what they do they make their history but they don't make all of the history uh, and of course they they also make history in the way that I make curries I make a curry but I make a mess uh, <laughs> and that's what people do with history too and I'll shut up now. So I'm sorry I went over time and um sorry.